Welcome back to the 221st episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, two of which talk about energy, one about the new pricing structure in California and how it's going to bite some people in the butt when they go to pay their utilities, and another article talking about uh, Biden restricting LNG, liquid natural gas, and how that could affect the United States economy, and then a local story about a Kentucky legislator going into the community and talking about DEI programs. And of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So is it fair for people who make a little bit more money to pay more for their utilities? And what I mean by that is not, oh, okay, hey, you have a bigger house, so you're going to pay more for your utilities. No, what I mean is, okay, we see you make $100,000 instead of your neighbor who makes 50000 So now your base rate, instead of it being $5 for every kilowatt hour, it's going to be $10. And yes, I understand how outrageous that would actually be if it was that expensive, but it is just a example. Is that a right way to go about it? Because that's going to be very relevant to our first story. I'd love to hear everybody's opinions. Throw them down there in the comment section. Now let's jump to it. This comes from the New York Sun, and the headline reads, Newsom defends equitable plan to base electric bills on homeowners' income instead of usage, even as Democrats voice opposition. So when I first was looking through this, and I think I actually did a you know very quick at the end of an episode report about the possibility of this coming through. It was being passed, but you know there wasn't an actual rule on the books on how they were going to implement it. And now the departments that be in California are actually trying to find a way to make it work, make it tangible. So that residents who make more money than other people within their state are going to have to pay more money. Now, there's a lot of different things that are at play here that you could argue about. What I find extremely, extremely interesting about it is the conversation as to whether or not electricity is a completely public good and should therefore be treated as something that is provided at the lowest rate in order to facilitate people living. Um, Whether or not you like it, we have a system where there are a lot of natural monopolies, where to put up the infrastructure to get all of the grid in place, all of the different ways to actually produce the electricity, that is a very high upfront cost. And therefore, the people that came in first were probably the ones that are going to dominate. They're going to buy out a lot of their rivals because they have a slight advantage. And then they could, in theory, raise prices in order to make it really hard for the other companies to come in and, well, you would argue, okay, well, if they raise their prices, they actually have a market opportunity. But because of the large lead they had, so to speak, within the market, then it makes it a little bit harder because they're retaining a lot of profits. They can build out their infrastructure. They can make it 10 times better because a lot of these electric grids do need a, I don't want to say 24-7, but they at least need a pretty large team to go around, make sure everything is okay, that the electricity is getting to where it needs to go. And then because they also have a large uh, monopoly, so to speak, they have a grip on the market. They can charge people whatever they want. So... This has borne out every once in a while, and then the government says, okay, hey, we're going to make it a legal monopoly, but we're going to say you can only charge people X and X amount. And then the government's basically going to cover the rest. They're going to provide funding and grants in order to level out the profits so that the company's not losing money, they're just kind of existing, and that grants, those grants also allow the people on the other end to experience relatively low rates for their electricity. So then when we have this graduated system, what is actually going on here? And I want to be very clear. There are multiple ways to go about this, and the article doesn't actually get into the rules of how they're implementing this or why they're doing it exactly the way they're doing it. So 
if you go about it in a way where the government funding, the grants coming in, stay exactly the same, and you're just trying to reproportion where the le- rest of the money needs to come from, you are basically saying, okay, hey, if everybody paid 50 cents for their electricity, now we're going to do basically income needed or income based, and we're going to look at this person and say, okay, hey, they're paying uh, $20,000, they're getting paid $20,000 a year, and if they're paying all their electricity bills, on average is like $1,000, that's one twentieth of their income. So that's basically 5% of their income that goes to electricity versus someone who lives right down the road in the same area, same utility company, still paying about $1,000 a year for electricity, and yet he makes $100,000. That is one one hundredth, a.k.a. 1% of his total income that goes towards that, which some people would argue is unfair. So they're trying to balance out. They're trying to change the equation and basically find an equal point. And it's not going to be easy. You can't do it for everybody. The numbers aren't as clean. But somewhere to the effect where, okay, hey, 2% of the lowest person incomes and 2% of the highest people's incomes all go towards electricity based on these different rates. That's one way that you could think about it, trying to level out things so that they don't have to change the government funding, but they just have to change the structure of the payments. There's the other option, which is they're going to just artificially lower the people who are at the very bottom. They're going to artificially lower their amount that they have to pay and they're going to raise the people above them, but then they don't do it in necessarily an even way. They just do it in a way that's supposed to make it easier for people who are not making as much money. And I don't want to say harder, but they're definitely trying to structure it in a way that you can make up some of the costs, but to really make up all the costs by charging high-income people more money, it would be a lot more than you would think. So then the government's going to actually add some funding in order to make this program possible. And there are a few different other ways that you could go about it, but those are the main two that I think are really important to have a discussion about, mainly because... There's both of those framings still have lots of issues that people could argue with. One, spending more government money on a program that, for the most part, is doing, I don't want to say okay, because they do have infrastructure problems in California, but a system that has worked previously, why is the government getting more involved in that simply for equity's sake? Or the alternative one, where at the end of the day, it is still going to be the same amount of money, more or less, going to these companies. So it's not the government just handing out money in order to make this program work. But then you have the question of why. Why is it that if you are better off, you have to pay more for electricity? If electricity is a basic need, if it is something that in modern days we need to have, and that's why we have the natural monopolies now, that's the argument, at least, then why are you going to make it harder for somebody to have a basic necessity and make it easier for somebody else to have a basic necessity? And the the argument will be, well, hey, it's needs-based. If they can pay it, they can pay it. Yeah, sure, they can definitely pay it if they want to, but why would you limit them? Why would you even put that burden upon them? Why not treat everybody equally? Or there could be other programs that you actually do, like, tax refunds on uh, people who are under a certain income level. And you say, okay, these are the tax refunds for the electricity that you paid for. You can put them towards statement balances next year. Or, you know, you can say, hey, no, I want to take them as a lump sum on my state taxes. And I don't necessarily think that would work all that well, but what I'm saying is there are lots of other opportunities, there are lots of other practical ways that you could try to address this and not just say, okay, hey, no, you're making more money, we're going to make it tougher for you to live in California. And it's not just Republicans saying this in California, it's also Democrats saying this in California. And when I was going through, I was like, ah, oh, well, you know, I could see there's this idea of a more progressive progressive tax system on a lot of people's minds on the left. And on the right, there are some other people who would still argue that because they have a little bit more of a populist strain in them. Then again, there are a lot more Republicans who would argue, hey, no, just try to lower the taxes as much as possible. And since this is a government-sponsored utility, essentially, uh, I'm not saying they see it as a tax, because I'm not saying they see having electricity as a right, but they definitely see it as a way of more government interference and 
changing the equation to take more money out of your pocket. And when <laughs> the one person I was kind of shocked by was uh, Scott Weiner. But one of the California legislature's most liberal members, State Senator Scott Weiner, called the new income-based fee proposal outrageous. Mr. Warner sa- Weiner says that a family of four that makes a household income of just $70,000 annually will be priced out of life in the Golden State. And um, I'm not saying that you can live off of 70, you can't live off of $70,000 in California, but I'm pretty sure in most of the like cities, if you're making $70,000, you've already been priced out of California for a long time. Now, it's obviously different in places that are really far out and they're in the middle of nowhere, essentially. But my question is when Werner, Wiener, I don't know why I want to call him Werner, probably because he has a weird last name and he's uh, kind of notorious for lots of different crazy things. But my point being, seventy thousand uh, dollars—that's that's not a terrible income. That that's that's decent. That's okay. You can get by on that with two kids. It's not going to be fun, but you can get by on that income. And what I would ask is, so you're telling me that seventy thousand is enough to bump them up a progressive tax bracket? I would say there would they would be part of the groups that would probably actually get a discount. So. If Mr. Weiner's implication here is that the people who make $70,000 will be priced out, that means that they're probably going to get charged more. So then what is really the bottom line? Is it going to be people that are making $35,000 for a family of four? They get this break? I mean, that that's rough. I, I could, you know, If I was following their logic, if I was in the exact same mind frame, I understand that one, but I wouldn't understand if I was in the exact same frame of mind where, hey, we need to help out the people that are not making as much money as these other millionaires. I would still say 70000 deserves some sort of break, so I don't know where their logic actually breaks down here, and if it's simply for people who are the lowest of low income, um, they're probably not staying in a place for, for too long anyway. And they're probably renting. And a lot of different, I don't know how it is in all of California, I'm not going to pretend to, but I know in where I live in Kentucky, there's actually a pretty flat rate that I pay every single month. And I, I keep the lights off for the most part. I, you know, every once in a while I'll throw them on. I obviously have my computer running. I don't think I've ever paid more than like, three five dollars in a variable rate and what i mean by that is there's the baseline rate of like 20 bucks and then anything on top of that the variable rate so to speak has never gone over five dollars then again i am one person i am not running things on like a washer and dryer on my own bill that's fair there are lots of other expenses that go into it maybe you have to charge your car it's a hybrid it's a electronic car all the way and you got kids, so they need light to do their homework late at night. They want to stay up watching something on the phone, or they want to read something in their bed. So there are lots of other variables that can increase these costs. But what I'm getting at is that if you make a conscious effort to lower the amount of electricity you use, you can still make a huge difference. And wh- what I mean by that is... I am absolutely certain if I turned on everything, if I operated everything as if the electricity bill didn't exist, I know people in my building that are making, uh, that are paying probably closer to $40, so like a $20 variable fee on top of the, the baseline, and you multiply that out by force people, so to speak, you, you could save about $80 per bill, which may not seem like a lot, but when you're in, t- you know, really tight times, that that's pretty darn huge. So, at the end of the day, I think this this bill is misguided, and I think even the Democrats within California are starting to acknowledge so, because if it is simply, as I mentioned, the two categories, if it is simply redistribution for redistribution's sake in order to make people pay less, then you're really just punishing people for doing well, and why would they be incentivized to stay in your state when they're like, well, because I'm doing well, because I'm making this money, now I have to pay more just for the same amount of electricity that I was using before. Or it is a, a attempt by the government to be really good-willed and they're going to take other tax dollars for it and other people in, throughout the state that aren't necessarily you know, making the most money, but they still see what's going on. 
and they're saying, wow, my tax dollars are going to making it cheaper for somebody else down the road, but for me, it's going to be more expensive because I fall in a different tax bracket. Once again, I think this on a practical level, it doesn't necessarily make any sense for getting votes except for maybe the lowest income groups, which I think people in California who are the lowest income are probably already voting that way. And if you genuinely want to believe it's out of the goodness of your heart, I think there could be different ways to go about it rather than just saying, oh no, screw you people that are making the money, that are bringing in all the tax dollars at these corporations, because that's where a lot of California's tax money comes from, corporations and like Silicon Valley and a lot of these different industries, as well as people, because they have a high population and they have a high tax rate. But it just, it feels a little out there. And I'm just like, hey, okay, even people in your own party are saying maybe you should slow down. So, but Newsom, he has it in his mind that he's going to do it. So he's going to do it. He's going to go for it. And we'll see if he makes it through the next election. (laughs) I don't know. So let's jump to our second article that comes from Fox News. More than 150 Republicans take aim at Biden's moratorium on natural gas exports. So in the last article, it kind of went off the top of my head. I went more in a a theoretical direction, which I very much enjoyed. But I want to give this one a little bit more basis. So we're going to read the first paragraph, first paragraph and a half of this article. So you have a baseline and you... We're not talking really theory here. We're not talking economics. We're, we're talking about the practical implications of this one. At least the article tries to go in that direction. So I think it's important to read what they actually wrote. Quote, more than 150 House Republicans are calling for President Biden to reverse his moratorium on liquefied natural gas, or LNG, export projects. An action, they argued, negatively impacts the energy security of the United States and its allies. So let's break that one down very, very quickly. Why is it important to our national security? Well, there's an argument that could be made just like uh, on the other side, there's an argument that could be made against it when it comes to protecting the long-term security of our nation if you wanted to focus in on the environmental side. The other side of that would be, at the end of the day, we are an independent nation who has our own wants and needs. And in order to get products and things like this really amazing, you know, carbon, low carbon emission fuel, and let's be clear, low carbon emission carbon fuel. There are lots of other low emission fuels that are not necessarily carbon based. But to keep on going with this thread, in order to get this from other nations and other places that produce it, we may have to give up something strategically. We may have to give into deals that we don't like because they have leverage and they have the products. So to ensure that we don't have to give up anything we don't want to, that we don't have to make any deals that we may not be really favorable towards, that don't actually benefit us enough to outweigh some of the costs, you should have your own robust fuel-making sector of the economy, whether that is oil, whether that is natural gas, so on and so forth. Now, there's a subsection of that, which is there are plenty of business interests who are have shifted towards liquid natural gas because it has been perceived as lower carbon. So some people were arguing, hey, it's a little bit more green. Maybe the green lobby, and when I say the green lobby, I'm not making some huge conspiracy about it. I'm saying the whole span of lobbyists who advocate for green policies on the Hill or at the White House, maybe they'd be more okay with it. So businesses pivoted towards liquefied natural gas because it's a pain to actually refine and to transport because it has to be done in very special tankers. So, you know, the market incentive was there, but it wasn't necessarily just about costs. There were other factors that went into it. And now you're kneecapping the people that spent all that money investing by saying, hey, we're actually going to limit some of the exports. But I got a little bit off subject. I just wanted to explain what they were saying by national security implications. Let's go on to the next part. Quote, the Republican lawmakers led by House Energy and Commerce Committee Chair Kathy McMorris Rogers, Republican of Washington, and joined by House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican of Louisiana, Majority Leader Steve Calise, Republican of Louisiana, and Conference Chair Elise Stefanik, Republican of New York, penned a letter to Biden on Sunday evening demanding his administration expeditiously approve all pending applications to increase the global supply of natural gas. Very interesting wording there, the global supply. But um, the reason that they want to continue to 
put out a large amount of LNG and actually increase the, the capacity or the allowed capacity, so to speak. There's multiple factors. There are the business interests who have the ear of these people in Congress. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but they're probably talking to them up there like, hey, guys, okay, we have this deal with a European country, and we really want it to be able to go through, and we know that you care about Ukraine, so can you convince Biden to let this actually go through so we can actually make our money off of it, keep expanding this infrastructure, keep providing things at a lower price to America? There could be lots of different arguments as to why these companies could spin it and say that they're trying to help other people, which they very well could be. I'm not trying to degrade them there. I'm just saying they do have these people's ears. But the more important one, I think the one that is actually on a lot of people's minds is keeping Russia from becoming a strategically important natural, liquid natural gas supplier within Europe. After the war in Ukraine started, there was a lot of hubbub about going to Russia for fuel, for different uh, fuels such as oil, but liquid natural gas as well. And then because they didn't want to fund Russia in the war machine, a lot of European countries were looking for an alternative. And America kind of stepped up a little bit. There was a more investment in this infrastructure. They saw the war going on for quite some time. And let's be clear, businesses were already headed in this direction, but they said, oh, hey, let's speed it up. Let's make some more uh, refineries. Let's actually make some more drilling sites so we can get this out to the Europeans and then they can be reliant on us for their natural gas instead of Russia so they're not ending up propping up their economy. And I think that argument rings really true with people who are on the Hill who deal with lots of different national security advisements. And let's be clear, I'm not saying they're read in all this classified information, but they definitely talk with a whole bunch of different people, military personnel who argue, hey, you know, we don't want Russia to have this sort of influence and be able to use their liquid natural gas market as a way to manipulate, to alter the behavior of people who are opposing them in a war. And this actually strengthens our position as well, saying, hey, European Union, you need to stay behind Ukraine, and we're going to keep providing you that liquid natural gas. It gives us a little bit of leverage, too. I'm not saying that we're that cutthroat, but it is a little bit of real politique. And that's why I think this one resonates and why you're probably seeing a lot more of these people come out and argue against it. But that doesn't mean that the people who really love Ukraine, who want to keep this funding going, want to keep our strategical advantage in this particular market, it doesn't mean that all of them, of those people, want to come out and say anything because there's also the environmental aspect, like I mentioned earlier. And that's why you probably don't see as many Democrats coming out. You, you've seen one or two that I've at least been able to find when I did a quick research after doing this article who have come out and said, hey, okay, we need to cut this production. But even then, a lot of them are saying, hey, I understand the implications. I understand that we need to worry about Russia as a rising uh, energy power in the region. We don't want to have too much influence. But also, we need to cut the production of carbon fuels. And even if they're the cleanest carbon fuel, we still need to cut the production. So the environmental issue is weighing heavy on this one. And that's probably Joe Biden's motivation. Uh, I don't think he wants to kneecap the American economy. I don't think he wants to kneecap the American strategy as to becoming an energy supplier and trying to be a counterbalance to Russia. I don't think he wants to kneecap any of that. But I also think he cares deeply about the environmental issue, or at least people around him do, so they're pushing it. And that's the trade-off he's taking. He's taking electoral, an electoral win, saying that he's doing something for the environment, rather than doing the quote-unquote pro-business thing, which is what the argument from the environmentalist would be. So it's, it's a really tricky situation. And the reason I wanted to dive into it is to explain, and the, there are more quotes in the article that talk about the strategic importance of it, and that's why I wanted to explain and go further. Because when you see different arguments from one side or the other, and you just read the headline, if you had just read the headline, you'd be like, oh, it's Republicans being mad about cutting energy production. But no, there's an extra little layer in there. There's more calculations than just domestic politics, but also foreign politics. And we kind of get caught up in the headlines. We kind of get caught up in our own American-centric view of what's happening within our country rather than how we have an impact outside of our country. And I feel like we're really losing that nowadays. I, you know, I am a person who's contributed, and I still have a pretty laid-back view on uh, military involvement. I see the practical implications for it. 
I understand most of the arguments for it, but I have a relatively, hey, let's step back and really reconsider first. But this isn't direct military involvement. This is actually an economic game that we're playing, which is extremely important on the world stage. We know how the economic game, quote-unquote, we've been playing with China has panned out. We're afraid to criticize them. They've become, a, at least recently, you know, they've started to kind of calm down, but before they were kind of the producers of the world, so they had a lot of leverage in different negotiations with other countries. So we know how this economic game can play out. We know that at the end of the day, we don't have to use our physical might, but our economic might, our consumers, our suppliers, so on and so forth, here to affect change around the world. And that sort of argument I can normally get pretty darn behind because we're trying to promote uh, free trade, but also we're trying to promote our own products. We're trying to make sure that we have a market outside of the United States and we're not just solely closed off. And it can provide a good amount of influence. So these sort of strategic decisions are something that a president should care about. And the House is holding them to account. It's saying, hey, at the end of the day, uh, you got to care about this. Whether or not you're, you're good at heart, you have to care about this specific part of the issue. And that's why they're signing the letter. Now, will anything happen because of it? No. They get a good media story out of it, though, and then I get to explain the little bit more geopolitics that go into it rather than just the Republicans hate anything that Joe Biden does or Joe Biden just calls them mega-Republicans, so on and so forth. Uh, so let's jump to our last story that comes from Daily Kos. Kentucky legislator reveals a rationale for defunding DEI. So when I was first reading this one, I was like, oh, Kentucky, that's me. I don't, I don't know this woman very well. Uh, she is based out of Shelbyville. She, she's basically lived there her entire life. For those of you that don't know, Shelbyville is kind of like halfway between um, Frankfurt and Louisville, which means it's in the above the 50-yard line of the state and to the left of Lexington and to the right of uh, Louisville, or to put it a different way, you're probably about 35 minutes from the Indiana border. So what was going on? What, what's her rationale for defunding DEI? Basically, what she argues is these programs haven't actually worked. Um, so I'll read a little bit of a summary because I don't want to read every single part of this article. She spent about 40 minutes going through a set of slides she admitted were not meant to be anything more than something that would help her remember when she was talking to the audience. Quote, in 1979, what she called the Office of Civil Rights and Federal Government, by which she probably means the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, found that Kentucky's post-secondary schools were segregated and entered into an agreement to use race-based emissions to integrate the schools. In 2008, the OCR released Kentucky from this agreement. Despite that, the Kentucky Council for Post-Secondary Education who she said was in charge of all post-secondary education, was has mandated more diversity and, as part of those efforts, implemented DEI programs in all schools under their supervision. Minority enrollments in all of the public post-secondary schools in Kentucky continue to fall despite DEI programs, and she doesn't know how much money is being spent on DEI programs, but he think, she thinks it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So too much money is going to these DEI programs. It's not actually having the intended effect of luring more people who they're meant to support, and therefore she wants to defund them. And I, I think that her point is most definitely an interesting one, talking about how the board was set up in uh, 17, 1979, and then it was the rule about actually having uh, quotas, so to speak, in order to integrate schools has, you know, it's no longer mandated, but the uh, board that oversees secondary education is still saying, no, no, we, we actually want this to still be a thing. So uh, there's a little bit of institutional capture. And, it, and when I say that, I'm not saying, oh, they, they've infiltrated, the, they've taken it over. But the program is no longer mandated, and yet they choose to continue to do it. And the interesting thing about that is you choose to continue to do a program when it's no longer mandated and you're getting diminishing returns and you're spending more money on those diminishing returns. It needs to come under scrutiny. Why are they spending more money and having less results? Maybe they're spending more money per student and maybe that's a very interesting breakdown. Does it actually, we need to look at the results. Does it actually make a student 
uh, feel more included on campus, feel as though they're being um, socialized. Or it's creating more of a homogenous mindset coming out of that university, or is it causing more division? I think you need to look at all of those things and have those practical conversations before you can just outright say that we need to 100% get rid of them. But for the most part, for the most part, and I can't speak to every single school in Kentucky, I've seen some of these DEI programs and administrators up front, up close and personal. There's about uh, 100 per school at UK, uh, 100 per the school at UK. Um, they very often don't actually try to unite and make the life of people who are coming to the school with minorities easier. And what I mean by that is maybe they do offer some certain programs and that could make their life easier. They could make them feel more included. But another part of their job is to go around and tell everybody, hey, you have to include these people. And very often that causes resentment in other people. They're like, okay, why do I have to change exactly how I live to make sure that somebody else feels more included? Or the conversation in which I've heard from students, I've heard from one, I take it back, not students, one student about a conversation about a teacher saying, hey, you need to check your, your privilege, you need to acknowledge that you're white and there you have implicit things that just come along with your race, which you are not necessarily to blame for, but you need to take into account and you need to be more respectful of other people's perspectives, particularly, particularly minorities. And this sort of idea that simply because you are one thing or another, you have to change the way you interact with something else, uh, I don't think that's helpful towards the DEI mission. I don't think that actually helps with diversity. I think at the end of the day, it is just shifting the blame and trying to put problems on another group or just trying to say that this group is the issue. They're trying to find a victim and then have a victimizer. And I don't think that goes well. And I think that could be another argument. But I do want to see some of the statistical breakdown. So if she could do a more in-depth argument, because this was at a NAACP meeting. So if she could do a more in-depth argument, I would be very interested. But the author goes on to roast her and say that hey, we, we still need more minority students in school. And my question is, if we why do we need more minority students in school? Do we want more minority students in school? Yes, we want more students in school, period. But why do we have to have more of one group or the other? If White people want to go to school at a lower rate. Are we going to freak out and say, oh, my God, not enough white people are going to school? It's like, no, the people are making independent decisions on whether or not they want to go to school or whether they're capable of going to school. And if it's outside their means, then they're not going to go. And if it's within their means, but they just don't want to go to these universities or at least these big universities, they maybe want to go to something smaller. They can go to that. So it's basically a modern quota system that isn't even working to actually meet their quotas. And I think that's one of her main issues with it. So that's enough on all of that one. Let's jump to our daily delight. And this one comes from Parade Pets. And it's, uh, I honestly, I'm going to be real with you. I did not know that tree kangaroos were a thing. But apparently they are a thing. There's one at the Perth Zoo, and they had a, a baby. The mother had a baby not too long ago, and now we can finally start to see the little head of the guy. Quote, the female Joey was born about the size of a jelly bean just last spring to mom Koale and dad Hule, and has been busy growing and developing inside her, mom, her mom's pouch, the zoo shared. This week, while feeding Kalui her breakfast, our keepers were delighted to see the little one pop her head out and take her first look at the world around her. And if you want to see any of the cute photos or videos from this article, or you want to read any of today's articles, you can go to the link in the description below that like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, as well as Podvine. And you can also get the Twitter tirade Oh, oh, wait, Twitter tirade. What, what is he talking about? Yeah, there's a Twitter tirade. It's a little bit less formal. It's something where I don't necessarily have quotes, kind of just go off the top of the head. And that's over at the Twitter account at daily, your daily flip. And go over there, give it a listen. It comes out every Tuesday and Thursday. So with all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.